Hi, I'm Mike Coleman and welcome to this webinar. I am a developer advocate uh, on the Falco project. I actually work for a company called Sysdig, but my full-time job is sort of open source developer advocacy. Uh, prior to joining uh, Sysdig, I was at Google uh, working on uh, doing developer advocacy for Google Kubernetes engine. Before that, I was at AWS working on some easy cloud services. Before that, uh, I spent some time at Docker um, where I was an evangelist there, um, Puppet before that, VMware before that, Microsoft before that. So been doing this for a long time, been in sort of the cloud container virtualization space for um, about 15 years. And so uh, I'm gonna try to bring all that experience in and talk a little bit about Falco and how you can detect behavioral patterns or activities that will lead you to understand when you might be undergoing an attack or an exploit. So um, we're gonna do that in the context of five famous exploits. So we're gonna start with a quick overview of Falco. And after that, we're gonna look at these five different exploits and we'll have a demo for each one. Neo4j, Log4j, a path traversal attack on Apache. Um, actually, path traversal kind of is in all of these, or in several of these. Um, uh, a web logic uh, console access, remote execution. Again, it's kind of through path traversal. And then uh, Jenkins, uh, a Jenkins um, exploit. So, um, and then we'll wrap up with a quick discuss discussion about um, the rest of Falco's ecosystem uh, in the context of how you might use it um, in what we talked about today. Um, and then I'll leave you with some additional resources. Um, all right, so let's jump in there. If we go back uh, a while and we think about how we used to uh, describe security, we would almost always say firewall. Like our, our systems were inside data centers. They had this well-defined perimeter. And what you needed to do was just keep people out. We weren't sort of in this space at all where we were thinking about zero trust. We, we looked at most of the threats coming from the outside. And we knew that if somebody had gotten into your space, you probably had a problem, right? Well, if you compare that to where we are today with the cloud, there isn't this idea of a well-defined perimeter, right? Your, your systems and your um, devices, many of them sit directly on the internet. If you think of Internet of Things, all of these items, you know, there's still a firewall in place, but there's a lot more exposure. So if you wanna have fun, go put an EC2 instance or a GKE instance or an Azure instance or an Oracle Cloud instance, whatever, any cloud, DigitalOcean, I don't care. Take one of them, put one of those, their uh, virtual machines out on the internet with a public facing uh, network interface and see what happens. It's, it'll take a matter of seconds before it's inundated with people out there trying to figure out if there's a way for them to get onto the system. And then if you think about cloud as well, there's a whole nother layer of responsibility, right? You have IAM, uh, Identity and Access Management, you've got networking policies, you've got virtual private networks, you've got network address translation tables, you've got a whole bunch of different services that go together to, to secure your environment. And you have to make sure that the teams that you work with are using those appropriately and that they're following operational best practices. Right, they need to make sure they're not doing things like committing uh, API keys into public GitHub repositories, for instance, which is something I have done. Right, I'll talk about things you shouldn't do, and when I talk about things you shouldn't do, you can be assured I've almost certainly done them. I have done that. I have put my, uh, you know, uh, public key or excuse me, my private key for my public cloud up on the you know a GitHub repo where people can get it. And then you need to be able to understand, you know, this, these things. I had somebody tell me recently in a conversation that, you know, the most dangerous person in, you know, to your system, to your integrity of your systems is a disgruntled former employee. And I thought, yeah, I mean, that's pretty dangerous. They can do a lot of damage. They have keys. If they, if, you know, if they're upset, they can do a bunch of stuff on their way out the door if you don't know what's happening. Um, but I actually think the, the more riskier person um, is the overworked systems operator engineer, whatever, this person who makes an honest mistake, right? And they're not trying to cause problems. They just make a mistake or they take a shortcut, right? Thinking, hey, this isn't a big deal. I'm just going to shell into this container real fast and do something. Those type of activities, you need to be aware of them, right? Because that's where uh, vulnerabilities can be introduced. They're where you know, you've, you've defined rules of the way you operate. And when those get deviated from, they can 
either be an indication of something bad happening or an indication of something um, that might lead to something bad happening. So if you have a wall around your, your property or around your business or whatever, and someone gets over that wall, or maybe they're already inside because we talked about, you know, somebody making a mistake or somebody being disgruntled. How do you know what's going on? Well, you might use a security camera, right? Use a security camera to monitor the, the inside of the thing. You could, you could be looking for people wandering around that aren't supposed to be there, or maybe people doing something suspicious, and you could be alerted to that, right? And that is, you know, that's kind of the next level of protection. So even with the perimeter, with or without a perimeter, you know, a security camera is always good to have. And if you don't have a perimeter like the cloud, it's more important to have a good security camera than it is necessarily to have a good lock. If you've got no fences around your property, security cameras are going to be your next best thing. So, and that's kind of how we look at Falco. We look at Falco as a security camera for your workloads. So what we do with Falco is we monitor systems in real time, runtime, and we call it, you know, open source runtime solution, security solution. So at real time or at runtime, we're monitoring what's happening inside the system and we're looking for threats and either actual threats or patterns that lead us to believe that there could be a threat. And we can do this for Kubernetes, we can do it for containers, we can do it on virtual machines and bare metal hosts, and we can do it for cloud services, right? So. Um, we are a CNCF project. We're in the incubating stage. We have applied for graduation. Um, I think we're in the public comment phase right now. Uh, and we've got about 60 million pulls of our images up on Docker Hub, and we've got about 6.2 thousand stars on GitHub. So fairly popular production uh, project being used by some big companies to do um, to you know keep help keep their environment safe. So how does it work? So this is this is one slide. I usually take a lot more time on this, but I want to I want to get to the the exploits. So with Falco, what we do is we you know at the most basic level we have a, a kernel driver, a Falco driver that sits and has to interface with the kernel. And we can either do that through a loadable kernel module or an eBPF probe. And what we're doing is we're capturing syscalls. So everything that happens in the operating system is gonna go through a system call. So if somebody opens a file or moves a file or accesses a network port or anything like that, we're going to know that. Um, and we'll know that for containers as well because containers share the same kernel as the operating system, right? So we instrument the, op the kernel, we capture those system call events, we put them in a ring buffer, and then they get pulled up into user space, right? So we operate with a, with a Falco driver and kernel space, and then we have a companion component that runs in user space that compares those activities against a set of rules to know whether or not we need to let you know what's happening. And by default, we can send alerts to standard out, syslog, HTTPS, gRPC, right? So that, that user space kernel or that user-based component, excuse me, does a lot of things, but the primary thing is it does rule matching. And then it does something called enrichment, which is coupling metadata with syscall data to produce output messages that you can read, right? So we'll tell you what the container ID is, what the file name was, who the user was, um, what was the parent process, what was the child process, all of these things to make it easier for you to go off and do forensics and troubleshoot. So at the most basic level, we capture events from system calls, we compare them against a set of rules. If something is out of whack, we let you know. Um, and this is a Falco rule. This is a, the output of a Falco rule, right? So this is one where we're telling you a shell was spawned in a container with an attached terminal. So someone did docker exec minus it, you know, my container slash bin slash bash, right? And we fired up a bash shell in a running container, which is, you know, might be a, a, a thing you do, but most of the time for production workloads, it's probably not something you should be doing, right? So we wanted to let you know when it happens. Um, and then here's one, you know, netcat running inside a container. Well, that could be indicative of a whole bunch of things, many of them bad. Um, and we're going to actually use netcat in, in a few of our demos today um, to do reverse shell, for instance. So we let you know about that. Now rules have multiple levels, um, notices, warnings, critical uh, errors, I think is one. Sometimes I forget all of them. Um, and then we, um, and rules are customizable. You can create your own rules. We ship with about 80 default rules. Uh, you can augment them, you can change them, you can add your own, you can disable them, all kinds of different things to make sure that you have rules that meet your needs. 
So that is Falco. I detect events, I compare them to rules, I let you know if something is awry. So how can that be used to help you when uh, an exploit might be happening? Predominantly, we're not going to tell you if you're running a piece of code that is vulnerable, right? That's image scanning and our registry scanning and all kinds of things will do that. What we do, and in some cases we can, can do that, but for the most part, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you activities that look like an attack is happening, right? So did someone run Netcap, for instance? Is somebody uh, dropping a, a new binary into a container and running it that wasn't there before? We're gonna alert you to sort that sort of behavior. And that's what we're gonna see in these five exploits. All right, so the first exploit we're gonna look, like, look at is Neo4j. And uh, Neo4j is a graph database. And in versions point, through 3.418, when you had your shell server enabled, um, there, was the exp there was a remote method invocation service, an RMA service that was exposed. And it will, this service would arbitrarily deserialize Java objects. So what does that mean? So when you need to put things together in Java, uh, strings of bytes, you can serialize them, right? And you can, you can add all these things together in what's called a chain, and then you can send that out, and then the receiving um, uh, code would deserialize that, and then it would just go and execute it. Well, because it was arbitrarily deserializing these objects, and it wasn't really checking them, you could put whatever you wanted in them, right? And they could they could have uh, bad code, and whenever it was deserialized, it was just gonna run. And so the issue here is that someone can take, create a, um, uh, a set of serialized code, they could send it to the Neo4j server, um, and that code gets executed. So what we're gonna actually do is we're going to um, ship some code up to the server, we're gonna, we're gonna get it installed, we're getting it running, and then that's gonna execute. So you'll see that in the demo. And what you're gonna see from Falco is that we don't tell you that you're running the wrong version of Neo4j. What we tell you is, hey, somebody copied a file up here, they probably shouldn't do that. Um, and, and also there's a binary that's running now that was not in your base engine. Um, so now again, this has been fixed. They've, they've, they've replaced this, this shell object and, and in later versions. So it's, it's a known exploit, but there is a defense against it as is the case in every one of these. I'm not showing you anything that hasn't been out for a while that there aren't easy fixes available for. So, um, Okay, so let's take a look at this now. As you can see here, I've got the Neo4j server running. Now, I've got the Neo4j server. I'm going to be using something called exploit.jar, and that is a wrapper that I downloaded from Volhub, and it allows us to send commands to this server. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use exploit.jar to just touch a file on the system, right? Create a new file. So exploit.jar, URL of the Neo4j server, touch temp.owned. If I go over and I look at the directory structure of the Neo4j server, which is running in a Docker container, um, I go into the container, I look at the temp directory, there's that owned file. So you can see that I was able to send that payload in via the, the shell interface. Now let's do the same thing. I'm gonna download a crypto miner here, XM rig, and now I'm going to uh, extract that crypto miner onto the system. And let me clear the screen because it's getting a little bit crowded. And um, then we're going to go ahead and let's go ahead and actually execute XM rig. So we're just going to give it a command to go mine some Monero. And again, if I go back over to the Neo4j Docker container and I do a PS against that, actually, I can just do it here on the host. Um, and I can see XM rig is running here on the host and I've actually killed it. So now if I go into Sidekick UI, I've got this zoomed in a little bit so it's easier to read. Um, you can see here that is where, you know, this is where I copied the file in. And this is the, the, the uh, notification we got. And this is the notification that we were executing a binary that was not part of that base image. The next one we're gonna look at is log4j. And so log4j, pretty famous, um, it's a logging server. And log4j uses something called JNDI, which is the Java Naming and Directory Interface. And JNDI can pull objects from directory services. So when uh, an entry is written to the log, that entry could actually be, hey, go pull this information from this directory service and, um, 
and and then bring it bring it on in. And the thing is that those objects can be just information. They could be text or whatever, but they can also be code, right? And um, in certain versions of log4j, this code was going to be arbitrarily executed. So you would basically, you know, it's it's a fairly, you know, complex compared to, you know, it's the most complex one we're showing today, or right? there's others obviously that are much more complex than this, but this is a little more complex than what we showed in the last one. So what we have here is we're gonna set up an LDAP server, a lightweight directory access protocol server. And that's one of the servers that JNDI can communicate with. And we're gonna set up an, LD, an LDAP server and we're going to have a object out there that is malicious. And what it will do is it will instantiate a reverse shell. And so you're gonna see me start an LDAP server, start up a, um, a listener, and then we're gonna execute this remote shell back using this object. So, um, you know, and what's gonna happen with Falco is Falco is gonna say, hey, you know, someone's sending standard out to a network connection, right? They're redirecting the console. And uh, Netcat is also running. So these two things combined are probably not good. Even on their own, they're not good. So let's take a look at that demo um, and see how this works in action. Okay, this is a Java application that logs logins attempts to log4j. So when I go to log in, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to send it a directory query through JNDI to a server that has a bad payload. So let me start by starting that server. I'm going to start it on 104.155.96.228. Let me start up my netcat listener here. So this is the endpoint for my reverse shell. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create that payload. So basically you can see the IP address there of my LDAP server and I'm saying take this command, which is netcat to my endpoint, and run it. So when I log in with this, it's going to send that command to log4j. Log4j is going to do the LDAP query, and it's going to start the shell. So now if I come over here, I am logged in, right? So I can look at the file systems. I'm root. I can take a look at the processes, all of that stuff. So how does this look in Falco? So let's go back to the Falco UI. And here you can see I'm redirecting my standard out. I've got Netcat running. So I've been alerted to both of these things, which could be absolutely problematic. So then from there, you could decide how you were gonna handle it. The next one we're gonna look at is a path traversal exploit. So um, path traversal is the idea of, of trying to break out of a, a directory structure and move you know, through the directory or the file system traversing different paths, right? Or different directories. And normally you have something in, in the system and Apache has this, it's called path normalization. And path normalization looks for things that shouldn't be there, right? And, you know, if it, it, if it would see somebody going like web root dot, 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 and trying to get up out of that directory structure and be like, that's not cool, we can't do that. The problem was in this very specific version of Apache 2.4.49, there is the ASCII character, percent %2e, that in ASCII represents dot. The normalization didn't treat it as a dot. It just treated it as a string. So the normalization uh, function looked at it and went, oh, okay, and it just passed that on through. And then, then when the web server got it and interpreted the URL, it knew that percent %2e was a dot. So percent %2e made it through normalization and then was executed. So percent %2e percent %2e slash would be the same as dot dot slash, which would allow you to break out of the web root. Now, if you had CGI installed on the system, and CGI is a very common um, uh, scripting language, programming language, or interface for uh, Apache servers, if CGI was enabled, um, you could actually couple that path traversal with remote code execution, right? So, you know, with just the path traversal, you could look at sensitive files, but with, if CGI was installed, you could actually invoke scripts to run. And that's what we're going to do. And so we're going to first show how a sensitive file was detected, how it was access was detected. So we're going to look at pam.conf, we're going to, which is the configuration file. Um, and Falco is going to tell us that happened. And then we're going to use um, uh, this uh, CGI chaining together with this, this, this vulnerability to get a shell access onto the system. So let's take a look at that now. 
Okay, so here's my Apache server with a very simple web page. The first thing I'm going to try to do is just use curl to take a look at a, 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 an icon on the system. So if I do a curl against the Apache address um, and say, show me the a.gif, it shows up just fine. Now, if I try to go ahead and get to the pam.comp file using dotted notation relative to the icons directory, so dot dot backslash dot dot backslash, let's see, palm, pam comp, that fails. That's not going to work. But if I take those dots and replace them with percent two E's and try to access it, it actually works. So that's the problem. So now what I'm going to do is because CGI is installed, I'm going to use that same command, only this time I'm going to tell it to fire up a shell. So it's done that. So if you see here, it's the same thing, bin shell. So Falco should have picked that up. So if I go into Falco here, enter the UI, and I go to the event, you can see that we're getting a warning that a shell was spawned by an untrusted process, that Apache spawned a shell, and that's something we should look into. All right, the next one we're going to look at is Oracle Web Logic. And now this is actually two, um, two vulnerabilities chained together. The very first one, uh, 14882, is a path traversal attack. Only instead of like in the last one you saw percent %2e, this one uses uh, 25.2e. Um, and it, it doesn't... It, it, doesn't get normalized out, so that gets treated as a dot. And if you send a URL formatted with that ASCII string, you are going to bypass the console, console authentication. So with just that exploit alone, you can go to a WebLogic server if you've got access to it, right? And you can get to the admin console. Now, there are Java methods that allow you to execute remote code and if you chain 14.8.83 with 14.8.82, you can bypass the authentication, pass in that one of those Java methods and say, hey, run this code and it will do that, right? So we're going to use this, um, this exploit, these two exploits together to bypass the authentication, install a crypto mining rig and run it. And then Falco is going to, again, detect a remote file copy, and it's going to also tell you, hey, this thing is running, and it wasn't part of the base image. That's XMRig, and we're going to alert you to that. So, um, again, we don't, we don't tell you that these vulnerabilities were running in, in, you know, explicitly. We tell you, here's some things that happened that should be looked at. All right, so let's take a look at that one. Okay, so here's the login for the WebLogic server. And if I go up here and I change the URL and I go ahead and you see, I'm gonna put in those percent %25.2 E's to navigate to the console. And by doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and bypass the authentication. So here I am, I'm on the console at this point and I have full access to the system. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take this and I'm going to add some commands to it so that I'm able to execute um, commands arbitrarily without uh, authenticating. So I'll go in here. So I'm gonna do that same percent %25.2e in the URL, but I'm gonna use the Java language uh, get runtime.exec method to go ahead and just create a file on the server. So let me go over and check the server, and you can see here that that file now exists. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use that same methodology to download XMRig, the crypto miner. And so I've got that downloaded here. You can see I basically did a curl as the command. And then coming out of that, we'll go ahead and we'll use tar to extract that. And then we'll go ahead one more time and we will use the same methodology to go ahead and execute that and get that running. So now I have downloaded, I have extracted, and I am now running the crypto miner on the system. So let's go ahead now and we'll take a look. And if I look on the Oracle WebLogic server, there is XMRig running um, as expected. So what did Falco see? So if we go into events, and there we go, it's drop and execute a new binary in a container. Basically, there's, a, there's something running in this container that wasn't there before. So that's what, or that is what uh, Falco picked up, and that's what you would need to take action on. So our next uh, exploit that we're going to talk about is in the Jenkins server, right? And Jenkins is a CI/CD tool that is uh, very widely used for build pipelines, testing, 
uh, automation, all kinds of different stuff. And so that makes it a, a, a target for hackers, right? Because it's just so widely deployed. Um, and uh, there is a CVE out there um, that's based around the stapler framework, which is a Java framework that Jenkins is built using. And um, stapler allows users to uh, call public methods through a URL. And there is a, a, a vulnerability where um, well, typically these these calls are made inside of a, a Groovy sandbox. Groovy is like a Java-based scripting language that Jenkins uses. And typically there's restrictions around what can happen inside of that sandbox. It only allows certain methods to be called. However, um, there were uh, there was an error or a bug here where um, that the Groovy sandbox could be bypassed and allowed unauthorized users to execute arbitrary commands. Jenkins checks the script for errors before executing Groovy in the sandbox so that the check operation is not not actually sandboxed, right? And the attacker can use meta programming to execute arbitrary commands while in this checking step. So um, that's what we're going to show here in this next lab. So let's take a look at that and see how it works. Okay, here's our Jenkins server. I'm gonna log in. Now, one of the problems with Jenkins is the default username and password, admin, admin on this server. So um, I'm in the console, I'm just showing it to you. I'm not really gonna use it. Uh, I'm gonna actually move into the command line here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna issue a command to um, just create a file like we've done before. And so you'll notice that the command is touch temp.own and we're gonna create this um, encoded string here and we're gonna pass it in. If you look at, the, if you look at that URL uh, at the end there, you can see it's that check script routine that we talked about before. So it's in the secure groovy sandbox type of thing and we're gonna do the check script. Um, and then we're gonna pass in that value. And then what we're gonna see is that if I go over here and you know Jenkins is in a container. So if I look at the Docker container, look at the file system, there it is, the file that we just created. Okay, so let's set up a reverse shell using this exploit. So I've got a netcat listener that I'm setting up here on this machine. And then I'm gonna move back over to the original machine and I'm gonna issue a command to download uh, netcat and put it here on this machine. Now I've I've wrapped these commands in a Python wrapper so that I don't have to have that long command that we used before, but I've downloaded netcat, I've changed the executable bit, and now it's running. So I come over to my original machine and you can see I'm logged into the Jenkins server and I can list out the directories. So this machine has now been compromised. So what did Falco see? Let's pop back over to the events tab. And here you can see we're getting the warning that we've been, or someone's been redirecting standard in, standard out to a network connection, which is the NCAP process. And that's what's giving us our, our reverse shell. So that's an example of how this exploit can be used. All right, so we've looked at the vulnerabilities. Um, so you see Falco running as you know as we described it originally, which was like, look, we take system calls and we look at them and we take we do some sort of alerting. In this case, we were writing writing out to Falco Sidekick UI, but Fi Falco Sidekick can actually do a lot more than that, and you can actually take input from a lot more places than just system calls. So we have a plugin architecture that allows you to, to look for events from Kubernetes audit logs, Okta, CloudTrail, GitHub. We have a new one for Google Cloud Platform that was just released. So you can look at things like, did someone just publish their, their private key up into a GitHub repo? Did someone just try to access a, access a system and didn't use multi-factor authentication? Or did multi-factor authentication fail a bunch of times? So, and then rather than just sending to standard out, standard error, we can send that output to, to Sidekick, right? Which is actually what was happening the whole time. It was being sent to Sidekick and rendered in Sidekick UI, but it can also be sent out to all kinds of different endpoints, right? So you can send it out to chat servers or chat systems like Slack or Discord or Teams. You can send it out to logs like Elastic, uh, you know, message queuing systems. You can send that output to functions as a service platforms, to metrics platforms, to alerting platforms, and you could even write it out to a storage bucket. So with Fireco Sidekick, now you can take that output, that information, and you can start sending it into systems you're already using to let people know that these things are happening or even to take action, right? So you get that notification, it comes into Sidekick, Sidekick could send something to Lambda, for instance, or OpenFAS or whatever. So for instance, let's say somebody executed a, 
a, a new binary in a container, that could come in, you get that notification, you said, look, if this happens, if this level happens, we want you to go to Lambda and we wanna have a function that relabels that container so that it's not running in production anymore, but we save it so we can do forensics. And then, you know, then Kubernetes, when that one comes out of service, the, the deployment set will just, you know, fire up a new one and, and we'll be on our merry way. So that's how you can kind of do detection and remediation. Falco does detection, Sidekick helps you be build remediation you know pipelines or or you know um chains or whatever you want to call them so that's you know plugins and sidekick really complete the falco story now i want to leave you with some falco resources the first is our website so you can get us at www.falco.org um our github is github.com falco security we're always looking for new contributors Please, you know, if you've got an idea, if you find an issue, if you want to open a pull request, head on over there and do that. If you've got questions before you do any of those things, there's a, a bunch of different ways to reach us. The first is in the Kubernetes Slack on the hashtag Falco channel, pound Falco channel um, on that Slack server. So we're in there, the maintainers, the contributors, very active community members. Um, they're there all the time to help folks out. Um, we also host a weekly community call at 4 p.m. Uh, GMT, 9 a.m. Pacific. That is, um, those notifications are published on our LinkedIn. So you can go to the LinkedIn to find uh, a link for that community call as well as get updates from the project. Um, and we're also on Twitter. We're falco underscore org on X slash Twitter. So you can get us there. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I hope you've found some useful information here. If you have questions, I'm at Mike G. Coleman pretty much everywhere. I'm Mike G. Coleman at Sysdig. I'm Mike G. Coleman on GitHub, X, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, any of those platforms, you can just reach out to me and I'll do my best. And of course, the Kubernetes Slack. Um, I will do my best to answer your question. If I can't get an answer, I will find somebody who can. So once again, thank you very much. I hope you found this useful and I look forward to seeing you in the future.